Hello and welcome to this revision podcast on the 1905 revolution. The reasons for the revolution. The 1905 revolution came about for several reasons. Dissatisfaction with living and working conditions, the failure of autocracy to reform, revolutionary activity, the desire of liberals, mainly middle classes, for constitutional government, and although dissatisfied groups were disunited, the regime did appear to be under threat. There were doubts about the reliability of the army because of the defeat against Japan, communications breaking down and the economic and financial system was close to collapse. It is possible to argue that 1905 was not a true revolution at all, but rather a series of events which had in common discontent with some aspect of the existing order. The revolution was a series of sporadic outbreaks of violence provoked by individual circumstances such as naval mutiny and attempted seizures of noble land. The events did feed off each other, but were in no sense coordinated and were not all motivated by the same aims. Let's have a look in a bit more detail at the several factors promoting dissatisfaction. The long-term background factors, including the following. Nicholas II had done nothing to suggest he would carry out any significant political, social or economic reform. There was growing dissatisfaction from a gradually developing and more aware middle class and some nobility, which felt excluded from the political process. The Great Spurt an increase, had formed an increase in towns, um, and the people there were mo- more exposed to socialism. Poor working conditions and crowded conditions in towns, particularly in large factories, meant it was easier to circulate secret material like pamphlets to galvanise discontent. There were revolutionary groups such as social revolutionaries and social democrats, but although they became more active once the revolution started, they did not play a significant part in provoking it. The immediate background to the revolution included the following. The European recession in 1900, there had been an economic downturn and pressure on the land from a rapidly growing population. The sharp world recession hit Russia hard, but the world price of grain was falling, affecting the value of Russian exports. The impact caused unemployment and rising prices which particularly affected urban workers, whilst in rural areas tax on grain rose. The economic downturn and slump prompted the years of the Red Cockerel. Another reason was the um, stirrings of revolt in the empire against Russification in the provinces. Also, the Russo-Japanese War was a factor. News of the defeats in the uh, war had highlighted concerns over Nicholas II's personal leadership, exacerbating perceptions he was weak and too sentimental about his family. The Russians and Japanese were both looking to expand into China. Either Plev or Vita, no one knows for sure, persuaded the Tsar to embark on a short, swift, victorious war to stem the rising tide of domestic unrest. This imperialist adventure ended in disaster for the Russians as they underestimated the Japanese. They were chaotically organised and they were running a war 6,000 miles from the capital with an overestimation of the use of the Trans-Siberian Railway that they built. It seemed to confirm the incompetence and poor judgement of the Tsar, who considered himself an expert in the region after being sent there by his father before he had become Tsar. It also disrupted the economy, driving food prices up and it forced factory closures. Because of this, other incidents quickly followed. For example, Bloody Sunday. Father Gapon's union was a result of police socialism, where moderate unions were encouraged by the police in order to control the union's extreme activities. This union contained men, Gapon's union contained men who were sacked from the Putilov works and that caused a strike. The union organised a peaceful demonstration to petition the Tsar over their grievances, led by Father Gapon. The subsequent bloodshed caused many to lose faith in the Tsar. Although the marchers had not been calling for his overthrow, but rather for better working conditions and living conditions. Finally, there's also the Potemkin mutiny. Although this was a protest, although this was a protest against harsh discipline and poor living conditions as much as a political action. There were some army mutinies as well. There were some protests by national groups, some terrorist assassinations, some disturbances in the countryside, and none of them, like I said before, was particularly coordinated, but the tensions developed because the government was trying to maintain autocracy at a time of economic and social change, and instead of trying to harness new forces to its advantage, it was reluctant to do so for fear of losing monopoly on power and giving up autocracy. So what actually happened in the revolution? Like I said, arguably 1905 was not a revolution at all. 
it wasn't coordinated. It was a, cl- a collection of largely disparate events. Bloody Sunday, the Potemkin mutiny, the strikes, St. Petersburg Soviet, nationalist outbreaks, demands for independence from the Poles, Finns, Latvians and other nationalist minority groups, some mutinies in the army, resentment at the defeat of the uh, war against Russia, reaction to the famine, etc. All these events were relevant and some fed it off each other, but there was no one cause or direction. So let's have a look what happened in date order. In January, um, between the 3rd and the 8th, 120,000 workers went on strike in St. Petersburg. The government warned against any organised marches. But January 9th, Gapon organised the march on Bloody Sunday. 150,000 striking workers and their families marched through St. Petersburg to deliver a protest to the Tsar. But they are shot and ridden down on multiple occasions by the army. The rest of January saw reaction to the massacre and it spread across neighbouring regions, especially industrial centres, which experienced spontaneous workers' strikes. By February, the strike movement had spread down to the Caucasus and Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich was killed by a socially revolutionary assassin as the protest grew. There's also notably large rural disorder, especially in Kursk in February. By March, the strike movement had um, an unrest had reached Siberia and the Urals and by April, the ses- Second National Congress of the Zemstavis again demands a constitutional assembly and the Union of Union was formed. By May, embarrassment for the government as the Baltic fleet was easily sunk at Shoshima, having spent seven months sailing round to Japan. And in June, the soldiers were used against strikes in Lodz. Odessa was also halted by a large strike. And on June the 14th to 24th, sailors muted, mutinied on the battleship Potemkin, famously. In August, Moscow held the first conference of the Peasants' Union, and um, the Tsar issued a manifesto on the creation of a state Duma, and it was created by Bulgian and nicknamed the Bulgian Duma, but it was re- rejected by revolutionaries for being too weak and having a tiny amount of people who would have voted in it. In August 23rd, the Treaty of Portsmouth ended the Russo-Japanese War, and Russia had been beaten by an opponent they were expected to easily defeat. By October, the... Um, Strike action developed into a general strike and um, a council was formed to represent striking workers. This is called the St. Petersburg Soviet of the Workers' Deputies and it functioned as an alternate government. The Mensheviks dominated it as the Bolsheviks boycotted it and similar Soviets uh, soon created in other cities, for example, example, famously Moscow. On October the 17th, Nicholas II issues the October Manifesto a liberal scheme proposed by Vita. It granted civil liberties, the need for a Duma um, consent before passing laws, and a widening of the Duma electorate to inc- include all Russians. Mass celebrations followed this. Political parties were formed and rebels returned to Russia. But acceptance of the manifesto pushes liberals and socialists apart, as the socialists didn't um, full-heartedly agree with it, seeing it as an empty gesture. The St. Petersburg Soviet prints its first issue of, the, um, of its new sheet, is Vestia, and right and left groups clashed in street fights in October. The general strike was ended by the St. Petersburg Soviet, though, and in October there was also two naval mutinies, one at Kronstadt and one in Vladivostok. In November, the Union of Russian People is created as a right-wing, early fascist-type group aiming to fight against the left, and it's funded by government officials. Also in November, the St. Petersburg Soviet appointed Trotsky as one of its leaders, and he calls for a new strike as he doesn't have any confidence in the October Manifesto and thinks that it will be little other than empty words. But his strike is poorly supported in St. Petersburg. In December, the St. Petersburg Soviet is arrested en masse after the SD Social Democrats handed out weapons, and in Moscow, where there had been an uprising, um, rebels and militias tried to take the city through armed struggle. It failed, though, and was crushed. There were no other major rebellions, and um, the Tsar and the right reacted, the police, returned, police regime returned, and the army swept across Russia, crushing all dissent, and the revolution was over. So why did it fail? Well, it obviously failed because the regime survived and was still in power in 1914 when, indeed, there was a patriotic surge at the the start of the war. However, there had been changes, concessions, and this was one of the reasons why it failed. Nicholas had favoured a hardline approach in the Christian Revolution, but was persuaded mainly by Vita 
to grant concessions. He adopted Vitter's advice that some concessions were necessary to divide the regime's opponents. The masterstroke was the October Manifesto, which promised individual and civil rights, and in particular a Duma or a nationally elected parliament. Other concessions were made. Preliminary censorship was abolished and trade union unions were legalised. These measures allowed opposition newspapers to be published, although they were periodically suppressed, in, in fact, um, and radical agitate, agitators had the opportunity to influence union members. One of the other reasons they failed was uh, divided opposition. The concessions that were made... Uh, were made unwillingly and under duress by the Tsar, and he had no intention of honouring his promises, and certainly no intention of introducing democracy, which actually no European country had at this time. Despite this fact, um, and despite the fact that the dissatisfied elements in the 1905 revolution were not united in their objectives, the regime was still under threat in 1905. But the promise of a constitution in the Duma had the immediate effect of splitting them further, splitting the moderate liberals who wanted constitutional reform, from the few hardline revolutionaries who wanted a whole new political, economic and social order. Those wishing for a radical re- regime change or political social revolution were very much a minority, and the Duma was a sop to the liberal opposition and it drove a wedge between the two groups, the liberals and the revolutionaries. Force was also a reason why it failed. The revolutionary view was at best represented by the St. Petersburg Saviour, which was quickly isolated from the moderate liberals by the October Manifesto, and then force was used. It was crushed and it had real no widespread support. Uh, force was also used successfully to suppress, revo- suppress revolutionary activity uh, around Russia and was used to crush peasant disturbances, um, and the army was used as well as the police for this. Another reason was loyalty. The bulk of the population remained loyal, partly because they were apathetic, and or they had a state in the, uh, stake in the existing order and feared radicalism of the social democrats and social revolutionaries or because they traditionally just supported the Tsar. As already stated, the bulk of the army stayed loyal to the Tsar, and that was crucial, because you could use them to crush the rebellion. Although Nicholas disliked the concession of the Duma, he accepted it, because then by issuing the fundamental laws, he reinforced the notion of autocracy and scotched ideas that he might have to share any power. Therefore, he was content to let the first Duma meet in 1906, because by then the revolution had been crushed. Order had been restored and he'd asserted his own authority, along with Sacking Vitter, whom he was still unhappy with, for persuading him into any concessions at all. What was the significance of the revolution? Well, there was little part played in by revolutionaries. It happened despite rather than because of them. Some came back and joined in, Trotsky being the best example. But because they played a very little minor role, it cast light on whether it was actually a revolution or just a series of protests. And was there any real desire to overthrow the government and set up a new regime? No. So is it a revolution? Up for debate. But that's one significant part of it. The Duma was set up. That's another significant um, effect of the revolution. Political parties um, were set up for the first time legally, either in favour or against the October Manifesto. Vita was sacked. The Tsar was unhappy with him for the concessions made. Now, Vita was an exceptionally capable minister, and he showed that the Tsar didn't trust him, and if the Tsar had a trust him, he could have actually saved Russia. Who knows? Although Vita did later acknowledge that he didn't have to give the concessions and the Duma to stop the revolution, so maybe Vita wasn't um, as radical as the Tsar feared he was. Agrarian policies came out of it, perhaps. You could argue that's the significance. There's certainly more repression by Stolypin, backed up by political groups such as the Union of Russian People, the reactionary right-wing groups, and the Black Hundreds, who attacked revolutionaries and reformers, as well as Jews and other nationalist groups. So there's increase in repression. But the most significant thing is Tsardom survived and emerged possibly even stronger. It showed that the military was still loyal and there were few people dedicated to actual revolution. They just wanted better conditions or some political concessions. As long as the Tsar kept his nerve and the army remained loyal, the opposition would struggle to have an effect. It showed this. And the Liberals were horrified when they mixed with the revolutionary proletariat in 1905. They were driven away from social revolutionaries and divided the Tsarist opposition even further because they couldn't stand each other and they considered them to be little oiks. My words, not theirs. Right, that's the end of this one. Goodbye.